solo, I'm on a solo, solo. Picking up my plaster, putting it on my sign. I'm jumping in my falcon, booking in my sign. I'm a solo, I'm on a solo, I'm on a solo, I'm on a solo. Hello folks, this is Professor Watts, and today we're going to look at how we model economic growth with the SOLO model, named of course after the famous MIT economist Robert SOLO, not, uh, not another SOLO you might have been thinking of. Okay, so before we jump into the SOLO model, and I just want to remember what we've learned so far and where this model fits into our overall picture here in macroecon. We've talked a lot about uh, the importance of economic growth. Economic growth leads to wealth and a higher standard of living. And you see that in things like lower infant mortality, higher life expectancy, uh, much higher educational attainment. And even though you'll see a lot of income disparities in a wealthy advanced country, uh, the poorest people live at a much higher level. Okay, so most people in the world want economic growth. So that's what we're interested in learning about. Okay, now we talked a lot about GDP numbers and specifically real GDP numbers. That's how we can quantitatively and you know, I would say fairly accurately measure economic growth within a country and compare economic growth across different countries. So we can look at those real GDP per capita numbers and say, ah, oh, here's the rich countries. They're successful. They have successful economies. Well, they've had growth for a long time. The poor countries at the other end of the spectrum, well, they just haven't had much, if any, economic growth. Now, where does growth come from? We have addressed this so far. And we actually have kind of covered all the main bases, and the solo model is just going to kind of refine our understanding of one of these. So we know that growth comes from having a sound economy, having the market process functioning, okay, with competition, entrepreneurship, prices for all goods, accounting, economic calculation, profit and loss feedback mechanisms. We talked at length about those elements. You know, if you want to review on that, go back and look at the market process lecture. So we got to have that sound economy, and to have that, we need good in economic institutions, which, remember, are just rules. What's the most important element of institutions? You recall it's property rights, individual ownership of the means of production. Property rights are key, and in order to have that, you have to have a sound government and a good legal system and competition and a, and a host of other elements. Uh, political stability and if you want to review that again you can go look at my lecture video on institutions okay so institutions and i've i've you know stated that probably institutions is probably the most important thing in economics because it is the most foundational thing so if you have good institutions in place you can have the market process and then this growth model applies because this growth model is kind of assuming a lot of groundwork so once you have these elements in place then we can start to talk about this process of capital, which is, remember, tools that make us more productive. And that kind of is the proximate thing, or that's the surface level thing that feeds into economic growth. As we build up more capital, tools that make us more productive, we become more productive. And you know we can start to get into a situation where every year we might produce more output per person than the previous year. So then we have growth. Okay. So capital accumulation then is the proximate or surface level thing. And the institutions and the economic process are the underlying things. And the capital accumulation, this is kind of the process we're going to start addressing more formally in the solo model. We're going to look at the process of, okay, remember what it takes to have capital. We have to have investing of resources and to invest resources to dedicate them towards creating capital. We had to previously have saved them. So this process of saving, investment, capital formation is hugely important here and this is kind of the backdrop the immediate backdrop of what we're looking at in the model and one other thing we should mention that we learned from the uh, story of the guys in the island was that they also had the technology embedded in the capital right creating the net that is a new technology that's a technological innovation so technology is always kind of goes goes together with or is embedded in the capital and the solo model will incorporate that element very nicely as well Okay, so let's dive in now to the solo model. We start with a production function. Most uh, mathematical models start with a, f a function, okay, just an equation that relates one uh, thing to another, relates an input to an output. So in words, the way we're going to think about the production th function here is just that output, which we measure as real GDP, is some function of these inputs, capital, technology, and labor. And to keep life simple for us right now, we're really only going to focus on one of them for starters, which is capital, which ties into what we previously discussed um, in the class. And 
in very simple terms, all we the relationship we need to capture is this. If capital or technology or the labor stock go up, output will go up. Right? That's pretty obvious, I hope. So the function, the equation we write down in the math will tell us exactly how much. So if capital goes up, exactly how much do we expect GDP to go up? Okay, so now, now we're going to do the math. Are you ready? Are you sure? Here we go. General form of the function. It just says y, which is real GDP, our measure of output, is a function, that's what the F stands for here, of three factors. The technology factor, which we designate A, the capital stock, which we designate K, and the labor supply, or the labor stock, the amount of workers we have, which we designate L. Okay, so technology, capital, and labor. And like I said, we're really going to only focus on capital for starters. And we can develop a functional form that's just this simple. Y, output, equals capital stock to the one-half power, which is equivalent to the square root of capital. So Y equals square root of K. Output equals square root of capital. Y square root? Why not, you know, K to the second power or something else? It captures this concept of diminishing marginal product to capital. And we uh, hopefully learned about this thoroughly when we did the beer factory. And we observed that we had diminishing marginal product when we added more workers to the beer factory and held the amount of capital fixed, right? That means we got less and less extra output from adding extra inputs. Okay, so we saw that we got less and less extra beer produced per extra worker when we added workers and held capital constant. Well, if we flipped that around and held workers constant but kept adding more capital, we would see that the exact same thing would happen. We would get less and less extra output from adding extra capital. So we have diminishing marginal product for any of our inputs into a production process. When we generalize that to the whole economy, we're just talking about adding capital in general, we'll see that we get less and less extra output from adding extra capital, and that's captured. Now we're graphing the production function, just in xy space, okay, so the, capital, the amount of capital is the x on the horizontal, and then the level of output we get from that is the y on the vertical, right? And notice the diminishing marginal product element. The, the line goes up, but then it goes up at a slower and slower and slower rate. You could say that the slope of the line diminishes as we uh, move to the right, as we add more capital. And the way you want to think about this is when you add one unit of capital down here, okay, so when you go from zero to one, we get a proportionately greater increase in output. Here we went from zero to one in output, right? The square root of one is one. As opposed to when we already have a lot of capital, when we go from 15 to 16, we're still plus one in capital space here. We're still adding one unit of capital, but we went from 3.9 roughly to four, so we only added plus 0.1, one tenth to output here. Here, back here, we added a whole one to cap to output. Okay, so we get less and less bang for our buck, so to speak, by adding extra capital. This ne this is always positively sloped. It never completely flattens out, but it keeps getting flatter and flatter and flatter, flatter. Okay, so diminishing marginal product DMP to, that's what's captured in this output function. We can already actually ab apply some lessons from the model to the real world. Uh, when we think about diminishing marginal product to capital, we can realize that poor countries, they have uh, little capital by definition, that's why they're poor, they face a high marginal product to capital. That means adding capital alone by itself is going to increase their output significantly. And if they can consistently add capital over time, they'll probably establish a pretty high growth rate. So they get large gains in output through capital alone. That would be exemplified by countries like China over the past 30, 40 years. When China liberalized their economy and went from strict communism to more of an open market type economy. Not a full free market like the U.S. by any means, but they opened up ownership of some uh, resources. They opened up some entrepreneurial elements. And their economy really took off because they have a lot of resources. We've got a lot of hardworking entrepreneurial people, a lot of natural resources. And by just opening the door to entrepreneurship a little bit and to markets a little bit, wow, they took off by cr creating capital where they basically had none before. Okay, so that's what we have labeled uh, catch-up growth here. On the other end of the spectrum, rich countries with a lot of capital, like the United States, we face a low marginal product to capital. We're not going to get a lot of extra output by adding capital alone. So what we want to focus on is the other main factor in the model that we'll look at here in a few minutes, which is technology. 
and we call this cutting edge growth. As I mentioned, that's what characterizes countries like the U.S. and other developed economies. It's, we're not going to get a lot of continuous growth from just capital investment, so we're going to look for having technology uh, development as well. Okay, now we're ready back to the model, and let's talk about what's going to determine the amount of capital we have and therefore our level of output. Capital is created when some output is invested in capital goods, right? We talked about the saving investment capital creation process just a few minutes ago. So instead of consuming those goods, we set them aside and dedicate them towards creating capital. And what governs that is what, what we call the investment rate. That's just the percentage of output, the percentage of Y, that we devote to creating capital goods. Okay. So we're going to have an investment function. It's going to be something like this, I equals 10%. So pro more properly speaking, the, the investment function looks like this, I equals I times Y, where this is that investment rate. So for example, if our investment rate is 10%, we're going to say I equals 0.1 Y. Okay. This right here is the investment rate. And then we can plug in different values for the investment rate. We can have it go up to 15 or 20%. We can have it go down. Okay. And that's going to determine how much capital we create every year. And that investment rate depends, it's a function of savings, right? Savings has to come first. So that will change when people spending saving habits change as a group. Okay. And we can actually measure that pretty well. We have a personal savings rate uh, data for the whole economy. So we can capture that through GDP numbers and through other data. So we have a pretty good idea of how much of our resources we're deciding not to consume right now but to set aside and dedicate them towards creating new capital. That's the investment rate. So that governs building up new capital. We have to remember that due to diminishing marginal product to capital and the fact that the investment comes out of output, so investment is a function of Y, our investment function, where we get capital from, that's going to have a diminishing uh, graph just like the output function did. Okay, The investment function is a function of the output function, so it's going to look like the output function. This little video clip will maybe, maybe help you to understand that concept. Dr. Evil, while you were frozen, we began a program to clone you. Cool. Send in the clone! Huh? He is exactly like you in every way. Except one-eighth your size. Okay, so did you get that? The investment function is essentially the mini-me of the output function. Okay, it's exactly like the output function in its shape. See how it's got that diminishing, it tapers off. As we add capital and we get to a higher level of output, we get less and less extra investment. That the investment rate is 30%. So remember, I equals I times Y equals I times Y, where I is the investment rate. So here it's given as 0.3, which would be, of course, 30% exp expressed in percent terms. And Y, of course, is our output function square root of K. All right, so that's how investment works. And this is what's going to build up capital for us. Investment is building up capital. Now, as I've said in uh, class, uh, one of my least favorite things about Michigan is uh, the rust. And why the rust? Because the salt, because we get so much snow and it's so dang cold in the winter. Uh, I had a truck actually that looked just like this. And when I moved down to Texas, I had the rustiest truck in East Texas. Why? Because it was a Michigan truck. I bought it from my father-in-law for a thousand bucks, I think. Great truck. Ran great. Man, I love that truck, but it had a lot of rust. Okay, so what does that represent for me? That represents the fact that my capital wears out over time because of things like the weather and salt on the roads and hitting potholes. And, you know, I can keep spending money to, to fix it up, but eventually it just kind of falls apart and becomes useless. And I kind of throw it away and buy, buy a new one. So all of our capital equipment is going to be subject to this wear and tear and kind of running down its useful life. And we call that depreciation. It's either happening through wearing out or just becoming obsolete. Either way, we call that depreciation. Right? So depreciation, capital, is kind of sometimes physically getting destroyed. Sometimes it just values going away, and it just kind of turns into junk. So we want to model that as well. We want to make sure we include that in our model. The factor that adds capital, investment, and here now the factor that takes away capital, depreciation. So we have a depreciation rate. That's just a percentage of all the capital in our economy that's going to wear out or be used up each year. Okay. And that's just, the depreciation function is, works just like the investment function. It's, it actually, technically speaking, looks something like this. D 
equals d times k, where d is the depreciation rate. So in my example here, 2%, so I'd have d equals 0 0.02, expressed as a decimal, times the level of capital. Okay, So that's some constant number, and we just would find that by observing uh, things in the economy and maybe looking for an average number. So we could theoretically actually find this value, but we'll just assume you know it's it's some small number, two or three percent, something like that. Okay, so we're adding capital through investment. We're losing capital effectively through depreciation. So what does that mean? Well, first off, to counteract depreciation, some of our investment is going to just replace existing capital because some of it's wearing out, and so we might have. A net increase in capital that's only going to be if investment is greater than depreciation we could potentially also have a net decrease in capital if depreciation exceeds investment and both of these scenarios are possible what we're going to assume okay is because capital grows at a diminishing rate but depreciation takes away capital at a constant rate okay so we can have three possibilities investments greater than depreciation and then your capital stock grows over time but that usually won't last forever Sometimes you have more in depreciation than investment. Depreciation is greater than investment, and therefore you're losing capital. Okay, and then finally you could have investment equals depreciation, and at that point K will stay constant, and therefore output or Y will stay constant as well. And we expect that uh, if, the, if the investment and depreciation rates are set and they don't change, we will eventually wind up at the steady state. And to think about that, let's look at this on the graph now. So now we have the full model on the graph. I've got output function okay with the with that diminishing marginal product aspect of the downward curve downward bend okay investment looks like output because it's a function of output it's just scaled to some fraction right the investment rate here is 30 percent and then depreciation now depreciation is a straight line function of capital so that's ch checking along in a, at a constant rate there so investment and depreciation will always meet right here at the steady state the reason why is because early on investment is greater than depreciation so down here at a low level of capital you get more investment you get more new capital than depreciation takes away and so your capital stock will grow for a while but as diminishing marginal product to output sets in you get less and less additional investment and eventually depreciation catches up to you if you have a large capital stock well, depreciation is going to be greater, pulling more capital away than investment is adding at any given investment rate. And so that's going to make you lose capital. You move this way. And either way, you're going to wind up hitting this point of equilibrium or balance, which we call the steady state of capital. So in the model here, we're going to get to a steady state where K equals 225 and I equals 15. Now, just kind of a quick side note here for, for the more mathematically inclined among you. You might be wondering, how do we solve the model, or how do we know exactly what the value k for a steady state of k, here it's 225, and then for the, the output that we'd have at that level. And of course, the output at that level of capital is going to be found way up here on the output function, right? Not on the investment function, okay? That's up here on the output function, so output equals 15. So how do we know those, those values for that solution? Well. Let me just quickly walk you through, and I don't, I'm not requiring my students to know this, but just in case you're curious, I do, I like the math. I'm, I'm a little bit of a math nerd, so I like the math part of this. So that's, that occurs at where the value of investment is just equal to the value of depreciation. So the way we solve for that steady state is this, I, we set I, the investment function, equal to D, the depreciation function. And we want to remember that the output function is y equals square root of k. Okay, that we're going to need that too here. So investment, remember, is i equals i times y, the investment rate times output, and the depreciation function d is equal to d, the depreciation rate times capital. Okay, so in the example above, whoops, we have investment is 30% of output, so that's 0.3 times y. And that's going to be equal to the depreciation function, which is 2% of capital, so 0 0.02k. Okay. Now I've got an equation, but I've got two different variables. So how can I solve this for one variable? Well, notice I can substitute for y, y equals square root of k. So can I say, instead of saying y there, I can say square root of k. 
right? So it's 0.3 times square root of k, I've substituted that value in, equals 0.02k. And now, if you know your algebra, you can solve this pretty easily, actually. My first step, you don't have to follow this exact sequence, but I want to get rid of the radical, so I'm going to square everything. So if I k, the square root of k times square root of k is k, 0.3 squared is going to be 0 0.09. And then square everything on this side too. So 0.02, that's 0 0.02 squared is 0 0.0004. And then k squared is this, k squared. Now I've got to get rid of an exponent here on k. So let's divide by k. So k squared divided by k leaves me just k. And if I divide this side by k, I, that cancels out and I get 0 0.09 equals 0 0.09 equals 0 0.0004. K. Now I can divide by 0 .0004. 0 .0004. and pull up a calculator here. 0 .09 divided by 0 .0004, 225. Okay, and that's exactly what we showed here, right? So k equals 225, and then we're going to plug that value in here. So y equals the square root of 225 y, of course, equals 15. Okay. So that's how you would solve the model. Now, in my class, we're doing this in Excel, and I have a solver set up in Excel, so of course we don't need to worry about the algebra, but there's kind of the background math, if you were curious. Okay, we want to go past that steady state ultimately. We don't want to be stuck at a certain level of capital and, and, and output. Well, two ways to do that. We could go for a higher investment rate. Of course, higher investment means more saving in order to accomplish that investment, and more saving means less current consumption. And that's difficult to do. And, and furthermore, just increasing investment gives us those diminishing marginal product of capital, right? So it's even not going to give us that much of a payoff. It certainly will increase our output, but at a diminishing rate. So in the long run, while investment is good and, and crucial, we want to think about another factor that can help us sustain economic growth, and that's going to be the technology factor, which will allow us to shift the production function itself up and therefore achieve a higher steady state of both capital and output at a higher level of technology. And if we can have continuous technological development, advancement, we can actually have continuous economic growth, wherein we probably never actually reach a steady state because we're in a situation where we're always accumulating capital. Okay, so let's see how that works in the model. How do we model this increases in technology here? Okay, well, we actually already are including a technology factor within the model. It's kind of hidden in there. Okay, so recall from your math knowledge that y equals square root of k is the same thing as y equals 1 times the square root of k, right? So let's go ahead and write that down. Let's show that, and then let's just call that the technology factor. So 1 is our technology parameter, and then to model an increase in technology, well, all we do is increase that parameter. Okay. So if I go from 1 to 1 1.5, what am I doing? I'm saying we had a 50% increase in technology. Okay, so what does that mean when we model it and graph it? Now, I know this looks busy, this is kind of crazy, but... Um, there's only one change here. So the blue is our initial output function, investment function down here, and depreciation function. So in the blue world, we were at this equilibrium A. Capital was 225, output was 15. Now what we've done is added, increase that technology factor from 1 to 1.5. So my new output function in red is right here. It's at a much higher level. So what we've done is we've bent the output function up, or we've shifted it up. If we bend the output function up, we're also going to shift up the investment function because remember, investment is a function of output. So investment has also increased. That means at capital stock of 225, we have an output of 22.5, which means we're actually going to have more capital. We're going to start the process of accumulating capital again right here until we get to C. C is our new steady state. And once we get to our new steady state of C, look where we are on the output function. We're way up here at C prime we're at a output level of 34 almost. Okay, And so what we want to notice there is by increasing technology by 50%, going from 1 to 1 1.5 in our technology factor here, we actually increased output by more than 100%. In fact, I think it's 125% going from 15 to 34. So tremendously disproportionate gain in output for our increase in technology. So technology has the much bigger impact in terms of promoting 
capital accumulation and growth in the long run than just investment by itself. Okay, so that is how the model works. A little complicated, I know, but once you go in, I think, and build it in Excel, and there's also a separate tutorial video that, that works you through that, I think you'll uh, get the hang of it. Now, a few uh, closing points I want to address. How do we increase the technology factor? Our textbook has a great section on this. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a few of the uh, points they make. Of course, companies want to do research and development. So that's where the bulk of new technology comes from. Conscious effort to discover new technologies, new products, and, and take them to market. New, new ways of producing things. The problem is that spillovers, meaning that people can copy the new inventions and new ideas pretty cheaply, limit the profit potential because competition erodes profits, remember. So how can we kind of guarantee, the, or I should say improve the prospects of earning profits from a new invention, new, new technology? Well, there's several ways we can do that. We can take profit out of it by having government subsidize research, and then once uh, discoveries are made, you just make that available freely to the public. And that's actually how we do fund a lot of research in, in basic science and Another thing we've done, and in America we've uh, really pioneered this, and we've had this for, for you know, almost 250 years now, is patents. Creating intellectual property, creating property rights, individual ownership with which comes incentives to develop that property and, and create new property, especially property in technology that's going to be very lucrative, very uh, profitable. So we create um, protection of profits, which is actually creating rents for those who come up with new technologies. Not forever, because we do want that to ev eventually diffuse to the entire world and benefit everybody, so that has a fixed time period. Patents have a fixed term of 20 years. So you can get some guaranteed profits, so to speak, for your technology for a while, but then eventually that patent expires and everybody can use the technology freely. So that's kind of the best of both worlds approach. Uh, another thing that the book uh, mentions and I think is really important is this concept of prizes for innovations. These have been used, uh, they're, they're being used currently, and they've been used historically. One of my favorite examples is the X Prize, which is actually an ongoing uh, foundation that uh, awards prizes for a lot of it is designed for improving uh, space travel and space flight, so for launching rockets that you can um, recover and reuse to make space flight much cheaper. Um, that's what the first X Prize was uh, given for, and they continue to uh, award these new technological developments. So it's kind of like a government subsidy for research, but it's uh, a prize where the researchers have to pass a certain milestone and kind of prove their technology before they can reap the benefits. Charles Lindbergh, he's famous for the first person to solo fly across the Atlantic but back in 1927, he was doing this in pursuit of a prize as well, the famous Ortigue Prize, which was for the first nonstop flight from New York to Paris. And actually many people died pursuing this prize because they were in big clunky planes, they were overloaded with fuel, they would crash and burn on takeoff. And uh, Lindbergh teamed up with this company called Ryan Aviation. They were funded by businessmen from St. Louis, and that's why the plane's called Spirit of St. Louis. And they developed a lot of really uh, high-tech, cutting-edge uh, aviation designs. For In this plane, you know, it kind of looks antiquated now, but it was very high-tech in the 1920s. And this arguably brought aviation forward by decades. So patents, prizes, government subsidies for research, all of these things can be used. And in reality, we use a combination of all of them to advance our technological development and continue pushing that A factor up in our growth model. And therefore, we have continuous growth because we're always kind of pushing the frontier of our steady state out to the right. And we're always climbing up that, that uh, output function. Then one final point the book makes is that, hey, more people could bring more ideas. So sometimes population growth gets a bad rap. Sometimes people think, oh, that's, that's bad for the economy because we're going to run out of resources. Well, that's one possibility. Another possibility is that with more people, we have more people thinking and working towards uh, technologies and ideas. And we could actually be better off because we get more technology and push up our growth function. And that can actually well more than make up for the extra resources those people might consume. So that's just some food for thought for you on how we would increase technology in the long run. But the main lesson we want to draw, and the main conclusion we want to make here, is that technology has the much bigger impact on long run growth. Capital formation, of course, is hugely important. It's kind of fun. It's the foundation of growth. But to sustain growth in the long run, you need that base of capital accumulation, savings and investment. And then on top of that, you want to add technological development.